Hello, BookTube. Today I shall be reviewing Lord Fowl's Bane. Uh, this is a uh, this is not the entire book actually. This is all, all three books in one. Because this is actually the first book in a trilogy that is itself part of a larger ten book series. Then we got Lord Fowl's Bane. You've got uh, the Illyrian War, which we'll be reviewing next, and uh, the Power That Preserves. So <clears throat> this series, so the first book came out in 1977. It's pretty obscure today. And uh, there's a lot of disclaimers I want to make about it. Uh, so first of all, the series has very dark themes, and the main character does a horrific act at the beginning of this book that many feel like completely ruins the experience, and that's what you will often find out about. It. Like I've looked up the series quite a bit, and uh, people are very—I wouldn't even say it's so much polarized. It's it's a very obscure series, and like a lot of people hate it. Like a lot of people hate it. There are people who love it though. There are people who absolutely love it, but there are people who hate it. And I understand why. The main character is deliberately extremely unlikable. And as I was saying, he does an extremely horrific act at the very beginning of the book, which many say ruins the entire series. Now, this horrific act um, kind of touches on this issue that many would feel is not handled well at all in this book. It was written in the 70s, so they might not have been sensitive about stuff like that. Uh, I'm not going to I mean, I thought it was fine, but I understand a lot of people would disagree. And so, if you might be sensitive to that sort of thing, then you definitely wouldn't want to read this book. But uh, that's all I can say as far as the warning goes, because uh, other than that, I have mixed feelings about this book. But overall, I am interested enough that I actually st already, I've already, at the time of this recording, started reading the next book. So, <clears throat> this series is really big in the 80s, and it will start in 1977, and it actually ended only a few years ago. Anyway, so it has this really fascinating concept, actually. So... It's about this guy from our world. His name's Thomas Covenant. He's this divorced uh, author, and he gets leprosy. But he gets sent to a fantasy world when he hits, when he gets hit by a police car. If you, if any of you guys uh, in the audience, say, if you read manga or watch anime or whatever, you might recognize this being an example of the isekai genre. And I find that very funny because I think this comes well, well before that. So it's interesting that way. But it's something like I've never ever ever heard of any other fantasy series where the main character, or even any character, is a leper. That's something you never get. And apparently the author drew from his experiences uh, growing up in India uh, with his dad, who was a missionary, and he treated lepers. So he got the idea from that, I'm assuming. <clears throat> and so the thing is, he sent to this fantasy world, which is basically ripped straight out of Tolkien. Like, if you actually, like, like there's stuff in there that's very clearly based off Lord of the Rings, various plot elements based off Lord of the Rings. Uh, I actually was okay with this, though, because the intent of the series is to take a Lord of the Rings setting and try to subject it to as dark stuff as you can possibly have. And they emphasize a lot of the darkness and the evil of the world. And they have lots of terrible, horrific things happening. I think, in fact, that the uh, the black and white morality of the land, which is what the fantasy thing is called, it's not a very <laughs> creative name, but I actually kind of like it anyway, is meant to uh, contrast with the real world being kind of gray. And so Thomas Covenant, as someone from the real world, introduces more morally vague, uh, bad elements to land that weren't already there, even with their evil in that land. And the main villain is Lord Fowl, who is very obviously, like, really obviously an allegory for uh, Sauron, and he's trying to take control of the land. I have heard people say that he's supposed to be an incredibly genius villain with this uh, amazing grass of plants. I did not get that in this book, even though it's named after him, but he actually did have, there was kind of a reason for that, and I'm assuming he gets better in later on in the series. And uh, as far as Thomas Covenant, the main character goes, he's a fascinating character, even though he's very, he's not a good person, but he actually was better than I thought he was. He actually, even though he does a horrific thing in the beginning, he does acknowledge that he did a horrible thing later on. And he, you see, he's going to say this thing. So the reason why he's a bad person is because he's afraid that if he becomes a hero, he's acknowledging that the land is real and that he's insane. Because he doesn't think the land is really real. He calls himself Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever. So that's why the series as a whole is called The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant Unbeliever. So the thing is, he wants, he doesn't want to be a bad person. But he does not want to be a good person. He's afraid that he thinks the land is forcing that role as hero upon himself. Because the land, they view him as a chosen one. And he feels like he doesn't deserve that title and he shouldn't have it. And it's actually a mocking, poem, mocking him because it's not real. And so he doesn't want to be a hero. But occasionally, he actually does do good things. He does selfless things even just to save people. But he also screws up during them at times as well. What, see, there's, uh, one of his main character traits is that since he's a leper, he's like conditioned to constantly check himself for wounds so that he you know, doesn't accidentally get gangrene or infection from something he didn't notice. And because of that, he has this like really like iron hard willpower and determination to survive. That's his main motivation, arguably, is just survival. 
And so because of that, he actually is able to perform very well in some situations that other people would probably break under because he's just so determined to survive. And I thought that was a fascinating character trait. Now, I will say the first third of this uh, book is definitely a big drag because it there's a lot of these token-esque... In, like, you know how Lord of the Rings would complain about those long info dumps? I'd say that's mainly in the first third of this book. And honestly, I didn't find any of them very interesting. You have these long gibberish type names that are made up language that's nowhere near as like, intricate or consistent as a token made language. And uh, they're all these really long infodumps. You don't really need to know about that much. And But it's only in the first third. It does drag quite a bit. But first third, though, I was able to pull through it. I'd say it does get better. They start doing that less. As far as the characters go, Tom, well, apart from Thomas Conant, of uh, side characters, there's only one of them I found was kind of interesting. The rest of them are very dull. They're really just kind of names, and they're very forgettable. Well, actually, one or two of them are kind of interesting. And, I, yeah, the characters are not very interesting. I'm hoping that improves with later books. But I couldn't really find myself very interested in any of the characters. They're kind of just, like, uh, you kind of know where they come from in Lord of the Rings, like elves or whatever. They've got these lords and people on a quest. And they're not very interesting. They're kind of interchangeable, to be honest. And uh, the writing, though, this actually is my absolute highest point of play is the writing is beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful I've ever seen. Like, I have a list in my head of some of the best prose, writer, prose writers I've ever read. Like, prose in the actual like text. It's beautiful. It's incredibly descriptive. He uses these incredible uh, metaphors and similes and the script and the script language. And he has a very arcane vocabulary. He uses very obscure words. It's a turn off for some people. I love using obscure words, but it's definitely not for everyone. But he uses that a lot. But, the, but I will, the, so it uses adverbs in a very strange way. Like he'll describe things as being hugely or someone moving grayly or wetly. And it's, I don't, that's just, I can't really, I, I'm sure that's not a correct way to use them. And even if it was, I still don't like it. It's awkward. But apart from that, it really is beautiful writing. The I think mean, the writing actually is probably what ultimately saves it and what makes you want to continue reading the series. Anyway, uh, overall, I would give this a three out of five stars. Like I said, beginning, uh, I wasn't told, actually it was kind of, I'm, I'm interested in the series particularly because it resembles in many ways, like some very strikingly similar ways, this comic book series I love called Cerebus the Yardbark, which I kind of have a love-hate relationship though, all the same. And that's what made me interested in the series because in many ways it resembles that series. However, for this first book, I'm not too impressed with, although I have heard that it really the quality picks up in the second book. So that's what I'm excited to hear. The second book is called The Iller of War. As I said before, I've already started reading it. So hopefully I'll get a review up for that fairly soon. Uh, anyway... Uh, thank you for listening. Um, <clears throat> remember to please the YouTube algorithm gods by liking, commenting, and subscribing. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Have a nice day.